It seems impossible this week has gone by so fast. It seems like just yesterday I was starting the seminar and now we're in the last topic of our seminar for this, this health seminar, health and happy, happiness seminar. You know, we've discussed a lot of really important things during this week about health, about caring for our bodies so that our bodies can truly be the temple of the Holy Spirit and so that we can discern God's messages to us to be able to live them in our daily lives. You know, and I always like to just kind of give a quick run overview of what we already presented, the importance of breathing pure, fresh, clean air, ventilating our houses well, proper posture. We discussed the importance of the use of our will. God gave us our willpower so that we can choose to do what's right, to use it with moderation, and to completely abstain from those things we know are harmful. We talked about the importance of sunshine and how sunshine can benefit us physically, okay? But also emotionally and mentally as well. And then we also talked about the importance of drinking sufficient water, pure water, clean water. Forget all the other drinks, okay? There's nothing better than water because it cleans our body on the inside. Just like when we take a bath, it cleanses our body on the outside. We also talked about the importance of the original diet, eating to live and not living to eat, okay? Remembering that food is to nourish our bodies, to give our body those nutrients that are necessary so that through the digestive process they may be transformed into healthy blood, into energy, into tissues of muscles, nerves, and bones. That's the purpose of eating, not just to gratify our taste buds and fill our bellies, okay? We also discussed and also did some exercises. And um, it's really important that we learn to use our bodies actively to be able to maintain a healthy muscle structure and bone structure, all right? Last night we talked about rest, the importance of getting good rest, what time to go to sleep and things that can help you go to sleep easier and to have a better night's rest. And today we're going to discuss trust in God and in His promises, okay? And before I do that, I just always like to give a word of caution. It seems like whenever we start into a lifestyle change, it's just really easy to go into extremes. And you know, there's a saying that says, the devil doesn't care if you're upstream or downstream as long as you're extreme, you know? And so, we have to be careful about extremes, okay? Um, you know, I've known people that say, oh, you gotta eat just fruit. Well, that's not right. God gave us ample provision of vegetables and raw seeds and nuts and whole grain cereals and legumes to go along with the fruits, okay? I knew some that promoted eating just carrots and potatoes. And you know, those are extremes. Another guy thought it was just brown rice. No salt, no oil, no honey. Just brown rice cooked. Well, come on. You know, I don't think God wants life to be that boring. He gave us plenty of good food to eat so that we don't have to contaminate our body, bodies with the improper foods that people choose to eat today that come along being the major cause of all disease, okay? So, I just want to put that word of caution out there, all right? Now, I know that a lot of things that we discussed during this week, you may say, oh, but that's too hard. Well, you know, did God promise us an easy road? No. On the contrary, the easy and wide road, where does it lead to? Destruction. To destruction. The path is narrow, the gate is narrow, and straight is the path that leads to life eternal. And few there are that walk therein or that find it, and I like to say that choose it, because it is a choice, a conscientious choice that each of us need to make. Okay? And so, Health is a choice, just like salvation is a choice. 
God has put everything within our reach that we might have health and have it in abundance. But we have to choose it as ours and make it a lifestyle, not just a fad that in a few weeks will go by. Okay? More and more today they're promoting this kind of diet and that kind of diet, but those many times are just extreme diets. What we need is a lifestyle based on principles and that's why this seminar has been based on presenting these principles to you throughout this week. So having said that, I want to go ahead and get right into the topic because it is kind of a long topic. I hope we don't run over too much, but we'll try to finish as soon as we can. Trust in God and in His promises. Is, is God worthy of trust? Yes. Amen. Yes, He is. He keeps His word when we keep our part. And I love this text that's found in Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. It says, seeing, that, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but has in all points been tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Okay? Because he's been tested in every point like as we, and yet without sin, we can now go boldly before the, the throne of grace, and we may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Okay? We can go boldly. In other words, with trust. Just as we would to our Father who we know loves us. Okay? And so that's point number one in helping us to know that we can trust in our Heavenly Father. Now, there are two great contrasts brought out in the Bible. And I want to share this with you. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. And then it goes on to describe what he'd be like. It says he'll be like a heath, or a, a branch in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in the salt land, and not inhabited. Now, here comes the contrast. We already saw one side. The other side is, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Amen. Okay? So... Now, I mentioned it's a choice. Which one do we choose? Which one do we want to be like? The dry branch in the desert or a tree bearing fruit, green, mm -hmm. offering life to all those around about. Now, you know, it's really interesting to think God's love is unconditional. And I'd like to share with you some texts that help maintain that idea. And I am reading this morning from the New Living Bible. Romans 8, and we'll start with verse 35. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35 says, Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecution or hunger or um, destitute or in danger or threatened with death and then going on to verse 37 no despite all these things overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the power of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ 
Jesus. So it doesn't matter what we have done in the past. If we come to the Lord and confess our sins, He wipes those sins away like as if we had never ever sinned. And that's a marvelous thing. He wraps on his, us in His arms of love and gives us the assurance that we've been adopted into His family. So there's nothing that can separate from us from His love. Now an interesting thing is His promises are conditional. You know, it's just like we as parents many times will say to our kids, okay, if you pick up your room, fix your bed, put stuff away, then you can go out and ride your bicycle or swim in the pool or whatever it might be, okay? Now, are we going to allow our kids to go do that if they haven't done what we asked them to do? We shouldn't because then that makes us liars, okay? So, God's promises are conditional. We're going we're gonna to get into some and just see what some of these conditions might be. And, and it's really interesting because God is like a loving father to us. Okay? And it's am amazing because Christ has always already fulfilled the conditions on our behalf. So through faith we can accept what he's done for us and then he empowers us that we may be more than victorious in Him. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an accepted end. An expected end, I'm sorry. An expected end. Okay? So, God's thoughts for us, we must remember, are for good, not for evil. He does not rejoice in the destruction of the sinner. Okay? He sorrows when a sinner is destroyed. All right? So then, another beautiful promise says, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings, from before mine eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Now when we realize we have not been doing those things, we've sinned against God, he immediately calls to us and says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And then he goes on saying, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. Now here again is a contrast. And it gives us that choice. It goes on to say, verse 20, But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isn't that interesting? So... If we're willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the land. And only He can put that goodness and that obedience in our hearts. Because we can't of our own self be willing and obedient. The only thing we can do is surrender our will. Amen. So that He can take it and mold it in accordance to His will and help us. And so that's something we daily have to do. Surrender our will anew to Him every day and every moment actually because Satan is continuously tempting us to take our own will back. Exodus 15, 26 is really an interesting promise because it reiterates the condition four times. He says, If you will diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God and walk uprightly before Him, if you will give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, then we can claim the promise which says, I will put none of the diseases upon you which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who healeth thee. What a beautiful promise, no? But again, just like a loving father, if you do, then you can claim the promise. Okay? And so, it's by surrendering our will to Him, asking Him to write His laws in our hearts and in our minds, that we can delight in putting into practice His law day by day and keeping it and giving ear to it and walking uprightly before Him. And it's only by our surrendering our wills to Him that we can do that. And then He can fulfill His promise. And I love Psalm 91. You know, it says, 
He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And it goes on saying, you'll be able to trust in him. He'll cover you with his feathers and under your wings he'll be, you'll be sure. And you won't have to worry about the pestilence in the daytime or the arrow that flies and so forth. And then it says, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Wow. But the secret is abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay? Dwelling. Spending time with Him in a continuous, ongoing way. And then we can claim the promises that are in that chapter. All right? Now, you know something really interesting that many times we ignore or forget? Forgiveness is also conditional. Okay? And, and I want to present in the next few texts the fact that many times physical ailments are directly related to not being able to forgive. Okay, did you get what I said? I want you to, I want you to really pay attention to this. Because many ailments, many diseases come about directly as a result of holding a grudge, retaining bitterness, anger, wanting to get revenge. Okay? And so as we go through these verses, I want you to keep that in mind. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth them and forsaketh them shall find mercy. Okay? And so it's important that we not cover our sins, but we confess them and turn from them. It reminds me of a story, a little country church, this old guy there, for years and years on end, every Wednesday night, he would pray the same prayer. He'd say, Father, please take the spider webs out of my life. Referring to his sins. And week after week, he would pray that same prayer for years. Well, there was a little old lady there that had heard him pray that prayer week after week after week for years. And one Wednesday night when he had finished praying, she immediately prayed and said, Father, please kill the spider in the life of brother so-and-so. <laughs> so he doesn't make any more spider webs. Okay, now we may laugh, but you know, so many times we confess our sins and then we turn right around and do the same sins over again. We need to confess our sins and then, what does it say? Forsake them, turn from them. Okay? And with God's grace, grow grow in Christ so that we no longer desire to sin but yet those sins be something of the past. Okay? By God's grace. Let's look at another promise. If we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Praise the Lord. Isn't that right? And then of course I love Micah chapter 7 and verse 18 and 19. Who is a God like unto you that forgives the sins and retains not your anger but casts all our sins into the depths of the sea? Praise the Lord for that, huh? That is so beautiful. I didn't have space to put that in here but I just had to bring it up. Anyway, how about this one? Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Interesting, huh? Now, I always like to add to that list, if it's okay with you all, jealousy. And how about gossiping? You know? So many times in our churches, there's division in our churches because of gossiping, because of not being able to hold our tongue. And many times, if you have watched gossiping, it's false anyway. You know? Um, so many times it gets twisted and, and it's not, you know, we're judging a person's character by something that they did and it may not have anything to do with that at all anyway. You know, I can't help but remember uh, an experience that we, that we knew about one morning this sister was on her way to church and as she was going by the pastor's house she saw the pastor's wife taking grocery bags out of the trunk of the car and carrying them into the house. 
And when she got to the church, she's telling all the sisters, oh, you know what I saw? I saw the pastor's wife taking groceries out of the car. She went shopping this morning on Sabbath. And she was just having a fit. And she was going to the next sister, you know, the brother, you know what I saw? And she was spreading this rumor all through the church. Well, the, pa the pastor's wife did not show up for Sabbath school. It wasn't until just before the sermon started that she walked in. And she noticed something was not right. She saw sisters in little clumps, groups, whispering. And then when she came in, of course, they said, oh, good morning, sister, how are you, you know? Well, after the sermon, she asked the sisters to stay for a moment. She wanted to speak with them. And she says, I feel there's something not right. Um, somebody want to tell me what's going on? And they were all with their heads down. Nobody wanted to speak. Finally, one of the sisters said, well, this morning, sister so-and-so, when she got here to the church, she said, and she, wait, 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 wait. Sister so-and-so, what did you say? Speak up. Let's see. And so she says, well, when I came to church this morning, came by your house, I saw you taking grocery bags out of your car this morning, like as though you had just gone shopping. And she said, you did? Why didn't you stop and help me? <laughs> huh? And then she says, you want to know why I was taking grocery bags out of the trunk of my car this morning? And they're all silent. She says, you know, sister so-and-so that has not been in church for months and months because she's been ill, I went to visit her this morning to have Sabbath school with her. And when I got to her house, I went early so I could get done and then come and be in Sabbath school in the church. But when I got to her house, she had not a mouthful of food to eat. Then the sisters began to see the true picture behind it all. The pastor's wife had gone shopping. She'd come to her house to arrange that food in a nice food basket, then to take to the sister as a gift on Sabbath morning so she'd have some food in her house. Okay, now, had the sister stopped to see what was going on and help the pastor's wife, she would have known. And she wouldn't have gone to spread a false story. Okay? So, many times we can't judge by what we see even though we say, oh, I saw it with my own eyes. Okay? We don't know the motives behind it. And of course, the, all the sisters started to cry and ask the pastor's wife to forgive them and so forth. So praise the Lord it worked out like that. You know, it could have gone on and deepened and they could have started worse things against the pastor's wife and against the pastor himself and so forth. So we mustn't let that kind of stuff go on. All right? And if we have something against somebody, we should go directly to them and speak with them. And many times the problem gets cleared up right away. Okay? So we mustn't gossip. And we should be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. And we can go a little step further. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, many, so many times we pray the Lord's Prayer and we don't even think about the words, but there's a section of it that says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, when the prayer finishes, verse 14 says, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not, men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Wow. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever heard anybody say, I'll never forgive that person for what they did to me. Do you know they're passing sentence upon themselves? They're closing their own probation at that moment until they come to realization of it and confess it and are willing to forgive, they can then receive forgiveness. Okay? But I can spend the rest of the day telling experiences that we've had throughout the years of people who have held a grudge and it caused them to be sick. I'd like to just share one. And this happened in Kwaktamak, Chihuahua. Years ago, we, I was working there and, and the lady that delivered, I was working in conjunction with a health food store. And the lady that delivered whole wheat bread, homemade bread that she made to the store to be sold, one day she asked me if I worked with people that had emotional problems and, and depression. And I said, well, you know, God is the greatest uh, psychiatrist in the world. And he can use me to help your brother, I'm pretty sure, because she told me that she had a brother that was really having problems. And um, 
<laughs> it was kind of interesting because he didn't want to see any, any more doctors. He had seen all the doctors he wanted to see. He was done seeing doctors. But he was living a life in seclusion. He wouldn't even leave his home. He was scared to go out. Um, the last doctor he had seen two or three months earlier looked at his hands and said, look at those spots on your hands. Those are nerve spots. Well, the poor guy was just looking in the mirror trying to figure out which was the next spot coming out because of his nerves. And um, it had been over two years that he hadn't been able to carry a job anymore. And for those last two months, he hadn't even been able to sleep. And even though he was taking medication, things just were getting worse and worse. And so the sister, without telling him that she wanted to bring him to me, she asked him to accompany her as she delivered bread. <laughs> and when she got to the store, she said, I brought you here because there's somebody here I think can help you. Would you go into his office? And he argued for a moment or two, and she insisted, and so he finally came. And he knocked on my door, and I said, come in. And he opened the door and peeked around the corner, and he looked at me and says, are you the doctor? And I said, yes, come on in. No, he stood there, and for over 10 minutes, we conversed with him just peeking around the corner of the door. That's how much dis, uh, desconfianza, um, distrust, thank you, that he had. He, he, he didn't even want to come around the corner of the door. But little by little, as we began to talk, the barriers began to be broken down, and he finally came on in. And all I can say is I know that the Holy Spirit gave me the discernment that his problem was a spiritual problem and not a physical problem. And so on the back of the diet sheet that I was going to give him, I began to write down promises from the Word of God. And, you know, like, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. And just promise after promise, I started writing down. And I was quoting them to him as I was writing them. But then I got to this part. I got to this part of forgiving so that we can be forgiven. And I read where it says, because if we don't forgive others, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us. And boy, the tears began to flow. So I said, obviously, something happened in your life that has harmed you, injured you greatly. And if, if you'd like to tell me about it, I'll be willing to listen. But the only thing I would like to help you do is to present it before the Lord so that he can take it away. And so between sobs, he began to tell me that when he was five years old, two older boys had taken advantage of him sexually. And this was something that was eating away on his heart. And he didn't know how to handle it. He was 37 years old by this time. He was married. He had four kids but he was unable to function as the father role in the home. He was unable to function as husband. He was unable to function in society because of this hatred that was in his heart. And so I began asking you questions. Do you know where these guys live? Oh yeah, one's a neighbor on this side and the other one lives two houses down on the other side of the street. Do you greet them? Well, yeah, but inside me, I'm trying to figure out ways that I can destroy them because I feel they destroyed my life. And I'm trying to, actually, I'm thinking about ways of murdering them. This was the point he was at. This was going on in his mind and in his heart. And then I said, do you know you have to forgive them? And boy, then the tears really began to flow. I couldn't forgive them. How could I forgive them? I said, do you believe that Jesus can help you forgive them? And he said, yes. So I said, I invite you to kneel and pray with me right now. So right there in my office, we knelt together. And I asked him to pray first. And between sobs, he opened his heart and said, Father, I want to forgive them. I don't want to be lost. I want you to be able to forgive me. Help me to be able to forgive them. And then I prayed. And when I got done praying, I said, you know, I feel that something good for you to do would be invite them to a supper and arrange it so that your family is someplace else and that just them two are there. And after they've eaten, after you've served them and they've eaten, then say, you may not even remember the incident, but there's something I need to say to you. That thing that happened back when I was five years old, I've had you come here today because I want to tell you that I forgive you. And boy, he said, I don't know if I could do that. 
I said, listen, we just prayed that the Lord would give you strength to do that. You have to believe that God will do that for you. And I said, only two, one of two things could happen. Either they could say, oh, you're crazy, that never happened. Or they're going to burst into tears and say, hey, look, we're the ones who should be asking you for forgiveness. Okay? And I said, if that happens, then you'll know that you can forgive them and that God has forgiven you, you've forgiven them, the thing is gone. Because by you holding that grudge, really, the only person you're harming is yourself. Because they, were ha they both had good jobs, they had cars, they had good homes. Okay? Well, I never saw him again, so I didn't hear it from him. But his sister told me about a month later, I ran into her there in the story. She was delivering bread one day and I said, hey, what's happened? She said, he did what you told him to do. And praise the Lord, they humbled themselves and with tears asked him to forgive them. And they forgave each other and it's gone. That very night, he slept the entire night in peace. And not too long after that, he was able to get a job He's back driving a car again. He's working. He's able to provide for his family. Praise the Lord. So you see how by forgiving, healing takes place. Okay? And it's so important that we learn to forgive because if we don't, it will produce disease and sickness and pain. Okay? Now, Christ told a story, a parable, he talked about two debtors. He talked about a king that one day going over the books of the kingdom found that a man owed him like ten million dollars in value. And he called the man and said, hey, let's, you know, get things taken care of. Pay me up. And the guy said, well, I can't. I don't have the money. And he said, all right. I'll sell you and your family as slaves and that way the debt will be paid. And the man fell on his knees and said, have patience with me and I'll pay you in full. And the king was moved with compassion. He felt sorry for him. He said, listen, you know what? I'm just going to forgive you the debt. Forget it. You don't owe me a penny. And that man left and went out. And as he was walking down the street, he met one of his co-laborers that owed him a hundred pence. Okay? Now a pence, according to what I understand, was a one day's wage. So a hundred pence would be a hundred days wage. Now I'm pretty sure none of us today at this moment has a hundred days wage in your pocket. Okay? But if an emergency were to arise and you had to get that money together, it would be a sum that somehow or another you could borrow or get somebody to loan it to you or something. You could find a way to get that money if you had to. I remember one time we had an accident down in Mexico. They were charging me over $3,000 because I didn't have insurance. I didn't have that money. And praise the Lord, I spoke to the pastor of the church. I spoke to another fellow that had a business. And between the two of them, they were able to loan me the money to be able to pay that so I could get my car back because they had it fenced in. And um, then I had to go to California and work for three months to be able to pay it back. <laughs> okay. But the interesting thing is that guy meets his friend and says, hey, pay me up. And there is says, oh, wait a minute, I don't have the money right now. Get, give me a chance and I'll, I'll get the money together for you yet. I'll, I'll pay it. He said, no, pay me now. And he grabbed him by the throat. And the guy fell on his knees and says, be patient with me and I'll pay you in full. And he would not. But he threw him in jail. Now when the king heard what had happened, he called the guy back in and said, hey, what happened? I forgive you that huge debt of $10 million just because you wanted me to. Couldn't you have forgiven that guy those hundred pence that he owed you? Now I think Jesus would like to have told the story in a different way. That when that guy realized he had been forgiven, he went dancing and skipping and jumping on out. And when he met his friend that owed him, he said, listen, the king just forgave me ten million. I'm forgiving you what you owe me. Forget it. You don't owe me anything. I think that's the way Jesus would like to have told the story. But so many times we're not that way. Somebody looks at us wrong or doesn't greet us the way we think they ought to and right away, oh man, I'm never going to talk to that person again, man. And we begin holding these grudges, okay? And it shouldn't be that way. You know, if we feel that way toward them, we should go to them. 
Is something the matter? Was something wrong? Did I say something wrong to offend you? Try to f figure it out. Communication is such an important thing. Okay? And so we can, uh, you know, we can work things out and learn to forgive like we ought to instead of holding a grudge. So, Forgiveness is to choose to free another person from our condemnation because Christ has set us free from his condemnation. It is to treat them as if they had always loved us because Christ has always loved us. Okay? These are words of Mark, Mark Finley in the morning watch that he put out. Hey, this, is, this one is from uh, Ministry of Healing. Forgiveness has healing properties. Wow, that's pretty strong, huh? That's a powerful medicine. When we choose to forgive others, even though they may not deserve it, we open our hearts to the healing power of God. Forgiveness is God's remedy for anger, for bitterness and resentment. We are encouraged to cultivate the spirit of forgiveness. Amen. Isn't that interesting? So, Forgiveness is part of our health message. We have to be willing to forgive to be able to have health and to help others to have health. And, you know, in, in um, James 5, 14 through 16, where it says to call the elders together to pray for the sick and anoint them with oil, it says confess your sins one to another and forgive one another their sins so that ye may be healed. Okay? So it is one of the laws of health and healing, forgiveness. But once we realize that we've been he, um, forgiven, it should fill us with thanksgiving. In everything we should give thanks. Even when things go, don't go the way we think they ought to, we should give thanks, okay? And we'll see that those things will be turned around for our good. The will of God is that we be thankful in all things, okay? And we can sing psalms and hymns and praise him and giving him thanks all the time for all things because this is the will of God for us in Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5, 17 through 20, okay? And thanksgiving when we praise the Lord, it produces endorphins in our brains, and endorphins bring healing, all right? And we can trust in his promises. I mentioned this promise a little while ago, 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, okay? We can trust. And then I love what follows right after this. It says, because we know we should be sober and vigilant because the devil goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he, whom he may devour, whom we should resist firm in the faith, knowing that our brothers in all the world suffer the same temptations. But God, after we've suffered for a little while, he himself will perfect us and establish us and, and make us strong in him. Okay? So it's important we read the continuation of that. Another marvelous promise that God has given us is found in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Praise the Lord, huh? So when trials come, we can know with confidence that it's not something greater than what we can bear, but that God will give us a way of escape. And again, here's where trust comes in. We have to trust that and believe that. Some people, oh no, it's more than I can handle. And this, these verses here in Matthew 6, they talk about the bird. They don't plant or harvest or store in granaries, but God provides for them. It talks about the lily. You know, the lily, one day is there, it's beautiful and bright, and the next day it's all wilted and dried up. But yet, even Solomon in all his glory wasn't dressed like a lily. Isn't that interesting? So sometimes we think we want to have really good expensive clothing and live in a nice big house and have fancy cars. Ah, 
but the little flower. <laughs> you know? And the thing is, that bulb under the ground trusts in God to provide the water for it and the sunshine so it can grow and have a flower. Just like that, with simplicity, we need to learn to trust in God. Okay? And it says there, oh, you men of little faith, aren't ye of much more value than many birds? Okay? And it, I love the way it ends up here. Towards the end it says, um, well, where is it? Oh, I'm not seeing it. Did it change? Anyway, I'm not seeing it. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Yeah, there it is. I see it now. Right here. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Talking about housing, clothing, food. When we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto us. He'll provide. You know, my brother once was uh, my older brother, he was call portering. And um, the way he was doing it was the brothers and sisters of the church would buy a certain number of boxes of books and then he'd come and take them and go to the homes and do the contact and, and try to sell them. Now these were paperbacks and so they weren't real expensive but he would present them saying, this set of books has a value of thirty nine ninety five, but they can be yours for anything you want to give me. One guy gave him five cents. My brother gave him the books. But my brother really needed tires for his car. And he prayed one morning, Father, you know I need tires. I know you can provide. I'm doing your work. So whenever you see fit. And that day as he was going from door to door, he comes to this one home and he says to the lady, he gives his little talk, I have these books and they can be yours for anything you want to give, even though they have a value of thirty nine ninety five. And the lady says, I don't have a penny in the house. But could you use some tires? <laughs> and my brother says, well, what kind of tires are you talking about? She says, well, come with me. And she took them out into the garage. And here were four brand new tires stacked one on top of the other, exactly the size he needed for his car. She says, I bought these tires and they weren't the right size for my car. And I didn't want to take them back. But if you can use them, take them. And my brother gladly gave her the books and took those tires. So you see, God will provide when we choose to do His will. I just praise the Lord for these marvelous experiences that can help strengthen our faith in Him and in His love for us. Do you know how many promises there are in the Bible? Have you ever stopped to think of that? Well, somebody counted them all. Now, recently, I, I should change that number because recently I saw a new number. Okay, 3,578, that was established as a number for a long time, but just recently I saw a new one was 4,110. Okay, somebody else did a count and said it was 4,110. Either way, <laughs> that's a lot of promises. <laughs> you know, we could read promises all day, and we need to learn to accept those as ours and be willing to fulfill whatever conditions it, God wants of us so that they can be fulfilled in our daily lives. And it's a marvelous, marvelous thing to know that God loves us so much that he's given us all these promises. And it should make us be happy. And here's another natural remedy. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Okay, so to be downcast and upset and angry or, or discouraged will make you sick. Okay? But being happy will help you to be healthy. And I love this one. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. And then the text that were read a little earlier today, Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord 
And that I like to always clarify this. It's not talking about fear of being scared. It's be fear of reverencing God. Okay? Reverence God and depart from evil. And it shall be what? Health, Health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. So here we have biblical proof that trusting in God is one of the eight laws of health and one of the eight natural remedies. Okay? So I want to encourage each one of you to learn to trust in God. Wait upon Him and He will direct your paths. Now I want to finish this morning with this text. And this text is a prayer in my heart for each one of you here today. These are words of Paul to the church of Thessalonica, but this morning I direct it to the Cleburne first and all of those that are here visiting. Abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. So brothers and sisters, we have an appointment in the near future on that sea of glass before the throne of God. And it's my desire that not one of you be missing on that glorious day. And I challenge you today to make that choice to accept the gift of health and of salvation that our Heavenly Father has provided for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. May God bless each one of you.